Right. Thank you very much, Yarik, for the nice introduction. It's really great to be here today at MCE. Um, actually, yeah, our, our story goes way back. And I remember Yarik was telling me back then that he was about to uh, start this conference here in, in, in Poland. And I had absol absolutely no idea of, of Poland back in the days. Um, and um, by now, it's grown into uh, a big conference. And it's really great to be here for the first time for me, um, being able to uh, tell you a little bit about AR Core and AR Kit, augmented reality, how you can make it happen in your own app. So this is going to be a relatively uh, practical talk. We're going to use mostly uh, Swift examples, but if you're a uh, Android developer, that shouldn't scare you off. We're going to start out by explaining the concept of, of, of AR, the concepts behind in detail. Um, which is very useful for you as an Android developer as well, and it should be anyway kind of easy to, to understand. As I said, my, my name is uh, Christoph. I'm one of the uh, founders at Scandit, and um, really glad to be here with uh, Luca, one of our senior iOS engineers. And um, just a really quick video about what Scandit does. Yarek already al alluded to that a little bit. We basically make the technology that powers barcode scanning, scanning in your mobile phones. So we're on more than 120 mobile phone, 120 million mobile phones worldwide, in various uh, apps of all uh, shapes and sizes, uh, NASA is one of our customers, or DHL, for example. So our strength is really we we scan very well um, all kinds of barcodes in bad shapes really fast, and we do that at the speed that lets you replace your expensive hardware scanner that the DHL guy has when they deliver a package at your door that costs 1500 US dollars. We replace that just purely with software. Um, but what we also do is we have um, AR technology that we developed ourselves that's actually not relying on the frameworks that we're going to discuss today. We have our own um, AR technology to um, um, build applications based on barcodes. Um, that's not going to be the subject of today's talk. We're going to stick to um, iOS and Android frameworks. But I'd like to show you an example here of um, what we actually do with AR. So imagine um, a customer in a retail store trying to find a certain shoe in a certain size. And they've got a pile of boxes uh, lined up in front of them with uh, barcodes. And um, they can hover their phone in front of that uh, pile of boxes and by that find the shoe they're looking for with augmented reality technology. So you select the shoe, you hover, and you see we display an overlay as soon as we find the shoe. So you can kind of see through the box and, and visualize the content. So with this, we're bringing the sort of e-commerce experience of filtering and, 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 and searching for certain objects to the real world to the retail aisle in a physical store. Um, and, and the interesting thing is 2017 was really the, the year of AR. So the two um, AR development kits that were, devo the, re that were released, AR Kit and AR Core by Google and Apple, they really kicked something off. They kicked off the development um, um, of creating immersive user experience and made that accessible to um, many developers that did not have access to that technology previously. We've all seen Pokemon Go, for example. It's been around for a while, so one of the earlier augmented reality applications on, on mobile phones. But this is no longer um, the only thing that's possible. You, you, you've seen now tons of applications, mostly from entertainment and gaming, but also uh, for consumers, the IKEA app, where you can place uh, furniture into, uh, your, um, into your home to visualize how that looks like. But all these apps, they have something in common. So basically, they augment the physical space with digital content. You place digital content into your space. Um, another thing that they have in common is that it's very important that the content looks realistic, that it's rendered well, uh, shadows and everything, and that perspective is correct. As you move your phone around in the room, the um, the perspective should be uh, should adapt. The, the the furniture should look realistic in the room, and you're basically replacing your imagination of that object in the room with a visualization. And um, there is a somewhat different angle to this as well. And you can also augment physical objects with digital content, not just physical spaces. And 
when you do that, the things around you, they actually kind of start to, to speak to you. They, uh, they, they, they say things, digital content, that you can visualize very nicely with augmented reality. And that lets you build IoT applications um, without actually embedding electronics as you, as you do that many times uh, when you have IoT. So the things really, uh, they, they start to speak ar around you. And that's very interesting. And it has many applications in business processes. It lets you, it lets you improve and make more efficient uh, business processes. Um, because you have a lot of databases in business. And all the data that you have there can be accessed through objects around you. And the objects serve as an entry point. So it's a very interesting concept. Um, to illustrate what I mean, I'm going to show you a few examples, uh, four real quick uh, videos on that. The first one's on inventory management. Uh, this is something that DM, the pharmacy chain in Germany, for example, uses, where they, um, where, where, where they see immediately, store assistants see immediately how many products they have in store still, in stock. So you see in red objects that are running low in stock. You move a little closer. You see when the next delivery is going to arrive. Another example is uh, an allergy checking app where uh, a customer this time can stand in front of, um, of a shelf, select their profile. So they have a lactose intolerance, for example. And they immediately see, again, in red which products they should avoid and, and, and probably not buy. Another example is HoloLens-based um, um, HoloLens picking uh, processes. The picking process is something that happens when you order from Amazon, for example. Um, so someone will go around in a warehouse, pick up all the products that are part of your order, put them in a box that can be shipped. And um, we built the solution here for um, HoloLens where we show the person who is picking which box they should pick up. We make sure that they're grabbing from the right uh, box. We make sure that they put it down in the correct box, directing them in the right, this, uh, right direction. Um, and the final example is price label verification. The problem that retailers often have is that the, the label with the price that they have um, below their shelves uh, shows one price, a printed price, which does not necessarily correspond with what they have in their database and that what is charged uh, to you during checkout. And we built this app um, using OCR and augmented reality that shows you um, immediately if a price label is correct. We do OCR, then compare the value with what we fetch from the database. And it is, if it's wrong, we highlight that uh, in red. Again, something that's um, uh, deployed um, in, at some of our customers. So wh what's common to all of these examples is that you're augmenting the physical object and there's really lots of applications for this paradigm in business. And in this talk, we would like to give you some, some, some basic concepts, explain some basic concepts to you that you will need in order to build such applications. We're going to start by talking about augmenting the physical space with digital content. Kind of the same thing that these apps that we saw before do, the IKEA example. But we're then also going into um, into the identification of physical objects, what kind of uh, um, options you have there. We're going to look into template images, recognizing images by their shape, and also how to use ML to recognize um, objects. And we're, of course, also going to touch a bit, little bit on um, challenges and limitations of these approaches. So let's start um, by looking into how you can use these frameworks to add content to the physical space. Um, one of the first things that you obviously need to do that is a 3D coordinate system of the world. The reason for that is obviously you need to maintain perspective. When your phone moves around, you want to render the content um, in the right perspective. And um, for that, you need to know where your phone is in 3D space, and you need to know where your digital content is in uh, 3D space. Uh, you see that in the example there on the left, um, the spacecraft, when you start this app, you see the spacecraft from behind. Then you're changing your position slightly, your pose slightly with the phone. The background changes. You see a different perspective, and you also see a different perspective of the spacecraft. Um, how, do you, how do you obtain a 3D coordinate system when you have a phone that just has a single camera, right? There's there's, there's other systems like Google Tango that have uh, uh, stereo cameras, but your average smartphone has just a single plane camera. How do you do that? Now, 
when you think of the the, the human um, how how the human uh, brain works, for example, right? In in general, you need two images in order to uh, get stereo vision. So we have two eyes that are positioned slightly uh, apart from each other, and then our brain will make up the 3D image based on these uh, two individual 2D images. Um, the way how this is done on mobile phones is by using VIO, visual inertial odometry. And the way how this works is as follows. You take an image at one position, and then you move your phone slightly to a separate, uh, to, a, to another position, and to, you take a, a, a second image, and you also measure the movement that you made between these uh, pictures that you took. And based on that, you can then calculate uh, the 3D um, image. The way how in, in initial inertial measurement, um, sorry, the, the way how you measure the movement is with an IMU, an inertial measurement unit. And that's basically um, a device containing several sensors that is very hard to calibrate and that basically creates an educated guess of your movement with that reckoning. Um, it is very hard to calibrate. Uh, there is really a lot of effort that goes into this, and this is basically the hard part about uh, this uh, 3D coordinate system that we need to build. And this is also the reason why Apple was first with releasing ARKit, because this is uh, something that Apple is, of course, very good at, integrating software and hardware and making sure that this is really calibrated across all devices. For Google, things look a little more tricky because they have so many different hardware devices. And that's also the reason why, as of today, um, Android only supports roughly 35 um, devices for, um, for AR Core. And all other phones, they are not, not uh, supported yet. OK, so um, when you think of the spacecraft, it's obviously great. You have a floating spacecraft uh, in, um, in, in the air. But that's not the case for your average object that you probably want to visualize. Usually, you have gravity that you want to deal with, and an object needs to stand on the ground. It needs to stand somewhere and be fixed somewhere. And this is where plane detection comes into play. Um, plane detection means you identify the planes in, uh, in, in your surroundings. And this is something that is supported by today's, today's framework, both for horizontal planes and vertical planes. It wasn't always like that. Uh, the first versions did only support horizontal planes, but not vertical planes. Important also, like if you have di diagonal planes, for example, that's not going to work. Um, and this is done by these frameworks by identifying distinctive features, feature points in your um, live video feed. and that's the kind of point cloud that you see there in the right image. And what's happened, what happens then is that the algorithms try to fit the plane through this uh, cloud. And obviously, in order for that to work, you need to have a surface that has distinctive features. So if you have uh, a plane that's just a white surface, for example, this is not going to work very well. And you'll have problems identifying your planes. Now, the next thing, when you think about the candle that you saw before, the next thing that you need to do is you need to identify where you want to place a physical object on a plane, right? And this is usually done by letting the user tap on the screen and identify or the, the, the position where they want to put the candle, for example. And um, ARKit and AR Core then have to map that 2D position on the screen onto, uh, into the 3D coordinate system of the real world. And they do that by sending a ray into the scene and finding the intersection of that ray with the plane, and that's then where the candle uh, will be um, attached in your uh, image. Okay, so these were a few um, basic foundations, and uh, Luca is now going to show you how to do this in code. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Um, okay, so I'm going to walk you through a few samples to show you the potential of ARKit and what you can do with ARKit and also ARCore. Um, so you might have noticed that uh, since uh, Xcode 9 there is a new template, it's called Augmented Reality App Template. And uh, um, if you choose that, uh, well, apart from the usual stuff, like uh, the language that you want to use to create the app, uh, there is a new pop-up men uh, pop menu, which is uh, called uh, a Content Technology. Uh, this is basically uh, the rendering engine that you want to use. Uh, so if you use ARKit, there are three different uh, 
um, rendering engine that uh, are provided by Apple. There is Sprite Kit, which is a 2D rendering engine. And then there is Scene Kit, which is a tree rendering engine. It's uh, quite, uh, has a quite level, uh, high level API. Uh, it's quite descriptive, so it, it's easy to use, but still the performance is, is, is quite good. And then, of course, if you want to be super close to the GPU, there is Metal, but you know, it's also uh, much harder to use. And uh, if you are building a game, then probably you want to check Unreal and Unity because they have uh, plugins for uh, ARKit. Um, if you are using ARCore and you are developing for Android, uh, the, the choices are quite similar. There is OpenGL, which is a low-level API. Uh, I guess you are familiar with this technology. Uh, and then there is C Informer. It was recently introduced by, by Google uh, last month, and it's basically very similar to uh, SceneKit. You have nodes, you place nodes, uh, uh, so each node represent, represent uh, um, a virtual object. You uh, add these nodes to the scene, and then you can add uh, uh, actions to animate those. And then, of course, there are, if you're building a game, then you can check uh, Unreal and Unity. They have plugins also for AR Core. Uh, so, uh, in, in all these samples, we are going to use SyncKit because it's, uh, um, it, it's quite good for um, all the samples that we want to use, uh, and it's very easy to use. Uh, so, once you choose SyncKit from the template, this is how the project will look like. So on the left side, and in the project navigator, you see that there is a, a scene asset catalog. So if you already developed a, a scene kit uh, app before, you're already familiar with that. But if not, this is just um, th this just contain all the 3D assets, all the virtual objects that you want to place um, in your scene. Um, Xcode out of the box uh, support uh, the Collada format, which is an open starter format for uh, uh, for these 3D objects. So uh, there are multiple websites where you can uh, download uh, these kind of models and you can just drag and drop and they just work. If you happen to have uh, um, um, a different file, uh, a different format, then there are also like converters. You can just open and convert into the Collada format and you can use it in Xcode. Um, so Xcode also has uh, Add, uh, as a, um, an editor, I don't recommend to use that to edit uh, your 3D uh, files, but it's great to actually check out that uh, uh, what what you imported. And it, for small uh, things, you can use it. Uh, for instance, for transformation, you can scale the objects down, or you can move the objects in uh, in a different orientation or position. Uh, so one thing to notice here: uh, so this is the uh, spacecraft. Uh, spacecraft uh, uh, object that uh, it's uh, in, in, in the template project. Uh, one thing to notice is, is the position uh, in respect with the Z axis. So this, uh, this uh, object is, uh, uh, so these positions are in meters and this, uh, this object is uh, about 80 centimeters away from um, the, the, the origin, the, the coordinates origin. Um, so what does it mean? It means that uh, so this scene will be the main scene uh, presented when the ARKit session start, and uh, it and uh, when the ARKit session start, the the initial position of the camera is the zero 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 position. So it means that this uh, spacecraft will be in front of us, about eighty centimeters in front of us. So let's let's see uh, let's run the app before checking out any code. So we start the app, and immediately we have a spacecraft uh, in front of us. Uh, we can move around, and the spacecraft will stay in that position. Uh, so let's check out the code that is automatically generated. Or actually, so let's uh, work through a few basic concepts of ARKit. So whenever you use ARKit, the first thing that you need to do is create an AR configuration object. This object contains all the options that you can set, set up for uh, the AR uh, a that are, are going to be used by ARKit. So you create the AR configuration object, and then you can start uh, the session. So the session will take input from the camera and from your uh, sensors. Um, then it will process uh, um, all this kind of information to map the real world to the virtual world. And the output is in form of uh, a sequence of AR frames. So we'll see later what uh, a few things that the AR frame contains. Um, when you use SceneKit in combination of, uh, with ARKit, 
then you usually use uh, uh, AR scene view, which is a subclass of uh, scene view. Uh, it contains an AR session uh, and uh, all the ARKit classes. So at, at any point, you can access uh, directly all the ARKit uh, classes, but most of the time, you, uh, it's enough to just uh, conform to the AR scene view delegate. And uh, through this delegate, you will get notified whenever uh, some ARKit or SceneKit uh, events happen. You, we will see that uh, soon. So let's check the, the code in the template. So the first thing is that we have a scene view, which uh, uh, um, will show the, the camera preview, but also the, the virtual objects. So we set ourselves, uh, in this case, we are inside a view controller. We set ourselves as delegates so that we can react to different events. Um, then we, we load this uh, spacecraft file, scene file. We, we load this file and uh, um, we set this scene to be uh, the main scene. Um, then, as I said before, we need to create uh, an AR, uh, AR configuration. In this case, we use a word tracking configuration. This is the user class that you would use if you um, are building this kind of apps. And then you can start the session. So, yeah, as Christoph said, placing uh, objects uh, floating around, uh, it's great, but usually you want to place objects in some kind of surface. So, to do that, uh, I will show you first uh, the sample. So in this sample, we are detecting a surface, in this case, the table. Once we detect uh, the surface, we can tap on, on the screen and we can place an object. And we can walk around, move around, the object will stay in that position. So let's see how we do that. Uh, so first of all, we need to enable plane detection. So um, we create our the user configuration object and there is a, a property called plane detection and we enable, in this case, horizontal and vertical plane detection. Um, yeah, so usually plane detection is not enabled. Um, horizontal, was, uh, horizontal plane detection was available since the beginning. Vertical plane detection was added uh, in ARKit 1.5 and in ARCore 1.2. Um, yeah, so once uh, we have this configuration object, we start the session as, as usual, and ARKit will try to find the planes uh, where you point the camera. So um, how this information is exposed to you? This is exposed to you through anchors. So anchors represent uh, a point or plane in the real world. Um, ARKit throughout the session will maintain a list of uh, anchors that you can access at any point. So there are two ways to um, add anchors. So you can add them programmatically. So for instance, in SceneKit, you add uh, a node in, in, your, in your scene and SceneKit will automatically uh, add uh, an anchor. Um, and then there are also anchors that are added automatically by ARKit. So for instance, you have a plane detection enabled, and whenever a plane is detected, uh, then a new anchor, specifically a plane anchor, is added by ARKit. And of course, you can, if, if you are, are subscribed, if you implemented the delegate uh, properly, you get notified whenever an anchor is added, uh, removed or updated, and you can do whatever you want with that. Um, also, another important thing is that when you create an anchor, you are basically telling ARKit that this point in space is really important to you. So ARKit will try um, its best to, um, to be more reliable uh, around that area. So this is the uh, delegate method that you need to implement to know when an anchor is added. Uh, so in this case, we are interested in plane anchors. So whenever a plane anchor is, is, is added, then we change the UI because we want to let the user know that uh, from starting from this point, it can place objects because we have uh, a surface, we have detected a surface, and so the user can tap the screen to place some object. Um, yeah, so then we need to um, handle the, 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 the tap, right? So this is just uh, run, uh, normal UI kit uh, stuff. So we implement a gesture recognizer. Uh, we get the 2D point. This is the 2D point in the screen where the user tapped, and then we perform it testing. So um, we do it testing in this case uh, against uh, existing planes. Uh, we could do that against uh, feature points, uh, but now we want to place an object uh, above uh, the table, right? So the it test uh, result returns a list of uh, uh, it uh, uh, points, 
And we are interested just in the first one because uh, probably the user want to place the object on the first surface, um, the closest one to, to the user, um, which happens to be the, the table. It doesn't want to place the object uh, on the floor, right? <laughs> That's usually the thing. Uh, and then we get uh, the 3D point out of this uh, first uh, um, result, and we can uh, use this point to add the candle. So the candle, um, we have uh, um, a scene file containing uh, uh, a candle, a representation of the, the candle. So we load this file. Uh, we load. Uh, we get the node containing the actual uh, candle from this file. We set the position of the candle in the in the in the three D in three D world. Uh, th this is the position that we calculated before, and uh, then we can add uh, uh, the node to the scene. And uh, as I said before, scene kit. When you add uh, uh, a node to the scene, it will automatically also add an anchor. Uh, so light estimation. This is another feature of ARKit. So ARKit will uh, will try to to calculate the the, the light in the environment and the, the source the, and the intensity. Um, so we can see that uh, in this example. So we added a, already a candle uh, on top of a table. I'm gonna switch off the light and the candle uh, light uh, adjust according to the environment light. So. This is a two-step process. So the first part is ARKit estimating uh, the light in the environment. And then the second part is SceneKit that is uh, creating light nodes representing the actual real uh, light so that it can uh, create uh, a virtual light in the, in, in the virtual scene. Uh, so to enable that, there is a property, uh, but actually you don't, you don't even need to uh, do anything because true is the um, default value for this property. So you don't have to do it, anything. It's it's already uh, all automatically done. Um, all right. Yeah. So with you. that, we're going to move over from uh, placing digital content into the real world to identifying objects in, in the real world. And um, there is basically three main approaches how you can do that. There is others that we're not going to gonna cover here. But um, for objects, really objects, there's three main approaches. The first one is with template images. So you basically feed uh, your framework a template of an image, and uh, the framework's trying to locate that image in your live video feed. It's basically pattern matching, you could say, simplified. Um, you're trying to locate the, ideally the exact same representation of the, the image. The next way how you can do it is with a 3D shape. So you have a 3D model of an object that you're trying to locate in your video feed. And this is actually something uh, that's brand new. So Apple just released that uh, two days ago at uh, WWDC. Um, and finally, the third option is uh, using machine learning and trying to find a certain concept in an image, objects uh, based on, on, on what it is. An example here is a car, right? So you're your, it, it's like the human, right? You're trying to have a concept of a car. What is it? The car is a vehicle with four, um, with four wheels, with a bonnet, with three or four, or five doors, um, and so on. And you're trying to find objects based on that concept of a car in the image. So it doesn't matter how the car is oriented, what color it is, what size it is. It's still a car, and that's what you do with machine learning. Um, let's look at uh, template images uh, first. Um, when you try to work, when you work with template images, there is a few restrictions that you have to uh, keep in mind. The first one is that the surface in the real world where the image is printed needs to be flat. It doesn't work with curved um, images um, on printed on bottles, for example. So uh, that's an uh, important restriction to, to bear in mind. Then another thing is that you should have a basic idea of how big that um, image is that you're trying to locate in the real world. You need to indicate that. Um, and finally, you need to um, to bear in mind that you can't have uh, an image that's, you know, for example, very wide and has almost no height. So there is certain width height um, um, constraints that you also need to follow. Um, Template images have been available only since a couple of months. Um, it was released on iOS in uh, April and on Android 
This is something that Google released um, at I.O. in the last month. Yeah, I have, have a mic. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, a sample of our image uh, um, recognition works. So uh, we have uh, a bunch of images and we are a supermarket and we are recognizing these images in, in these products. So how do we do that? Um, so in Xcode, uh, you create, uh, you have uh, your image asset catalog and you can create a special folder for these uh, references, uh, reference images, and, and you just need to drag uh, uh, your images in. Uh, an important step is that you need to specify, uh, you can see that on the right side, the actual uh, physical size of the object. This is used by ARKit to estimate how far this uh, uh, image is from the camera. So uh, once this is done, you need to load uh, these uh, reference images and uh, you can, there is a, a new property on the configuration object, which is called detection images. You just need to pass these reference images and you can start the session. Uh, then ARKit will try to find these images in the real world. And whenever that image is found, then an image anchor is, is, uh, is created and you will get notified about that. And uh, for instance, in the demo that we saw, we highlight the image that was found. So the other thing that is quite new, it was just introduced two days ago, it's uh, um, recognizing, identifying 3D shape. So how that works, it's, uh, it's, it's a two-step process. So the first step is uh, uh, we have an object, a, three, um, a real object, and we want to scan that object to create a 3D template. So for that, there is a new uh, configuration that you can uh, that you have to use to do that. It's called uh, AR object scanning configuration. You start the session and then you need to uh, scan the object that you are interested. In. So you need to go. You need to slowly go around the object. Uh, maybe sometimes it doesn't work at least in the first beta, uh, but uh, um, after a few tries it works and it will re uh, create a, a reference object that you want to store. Uh, somewhere, so in, in a file, for instance. So a few warnings. This is very costly in terms of processing power, so you don't want to, um, so this is something that you do at the beginning. You don't ship that to customers. You do that to create this, uh, to scan the, the objects. And uh, the other thing is that uh, um, this configuration disable most of the ARKit features, so it's not good for tracking, okay? Uh, so once you have this object, um, you need to, uh, this, this file containing the reference object, you can load this object, uh, you can um, add this object to the, t this file to the, um, to the project, that, uh, the, the final project. Uh, you load the file and then you pass, there is a new property in the word tracking configuration, which is called detection object. You pass this uh, reference objects and then you start the session. Uh, so from this point, uh, ARKit will try to find shapes uh, similar to the uh, to the template and whenever one is found uh, an object anchor is created and the usual uh, delegate method is called and you can do whatever you want with that. Um, yeah, so we saw how we can identify images and 3D shapes um, in the real world um, from templates but uh, let's go uh, to um, a more advanced topic, which is like uh, detecting uh, concepts. So um, not a specific image that match one to one, but uh, a concept like uh, a car. Um, you do that with uh, machine learning, in particular with a classifier. So what, what is a classifier? A classifier, you, you can see a classifier as a, as a black box that takes as an input uh, uh, an image, maybe containing uh, an object, hopefully, yeah. And the output is a list of labels and score. So the label represent uh, the object that uh, the, um, the classifier thinks it's in the image. And the score is the likelihood of uh, this object being in the scene according to the classifier. In order to, in order to tune this uh, classifier, you need a lot of uh, training data. These are like images of uh, the objects that you want to uh, classify. Uh, so machine learning, machine learning is getting um, uh, um, more and more popular, uh, also on mobile. And this is also thanks to Apple and Google that they released uh, uh, two great frameworks. Uh, one is uh, CoreML and one is MLKit. 
So um, how do you obtain a model that you can use uh, with these frameworks? So there are two different ways. So the first way is to like uh, is to download uh, uh, to get a pre-trained model. You can get uh, many from the internet. Uh, one example is ImageNet that you would use if you want to recognize uh, uh, some kind of uh, specific objects belonging to different, very different categories. So using ImageNet, you can recognize a cat or a dog or this kind of stuff. Um, if you want to recognize a scene to, to know if you are at the beach or in an airport, then you might want to use uh, MIT places, but there are different uh, pre-trained models uh, also for recognizing age, uh, um, sex, uh, uh, gender, uh, emotion, and uh, all this kind of stuff. That's the same thing. Um, um, the other option is to use your own model. So basically use tools uh, like uh, TensorFlow, Keras, uh, uh, to recreate. There are many more. Uh, you train, uh, you use this tool, you train your own model, and then you just need to convert that to the Apple or Google format. And you can use that uh, and uh, with uh, CoreML and MLKit, and they will just run on, on your device. Um, so it's possible to use CoreML uh, with ARKit. Um, the best way to do that is through the Vision uh, framework. This is a, um, a framework that uh, contains all the computer vision algorithm from Apple, but it also has an interface for CoreML. So what you do is like uh, take uh, the, the camera input that is uh, coming from the AR frame. This is the result of the AR kit processing. Um, then you, uh, Vision is taking care of uh, calling uh, ML kit for doing all the uh, processing and then you will get some output that you can use. So let's look how it, uh, how it looks in code. So uh, you have your own model in Xcode. Uh, whenever you have a model, uh, CoreML will create a, a model.swift file and this contains three classes, the model, the model input, and the model output. Um, you need to load the model. This is the first thing that you need to do. Uh, then you can create uh, a core ML request, and you define a completion handler. This completion handler is uh, called whenever um, a, a, um, the model, the, the classifier as a, as a result. So then you uh, create an handler, an image request handler. You pass the um, pixel buffer, which is basically the representation of the image coming from the camera. Uh, you get that from the AR frame, and then you perform the request. And once they perform, this is an operation that is a little bit relatively slow. And uh, once this operation is done, the completion handler uh, just above is called. Uh, so a few warnings. First of all, uh, don't uh, perform, uh, don't call this method perform request uh, on the main thread because uh, as I said, it's, a it's relatively slow. So you want to do that on a separate thread. You don't want to block the main thread or the ARKit thread. Um, then the second thing is that you don't want to process every frame that you get from the camera. This is uh, relatively low. Uh, so you want at least to wait uh, that uh, the previous uh, request was processed before starting a new one. Crystal. All right. So how do the two frameworks compare CoreML and um, MLKit? Basically, they have a very similar API and feature set, so there's not much of a difference there. Um, where they do differ is that CoreML is available for iOS only, while MLKit can be used both on Android and on iOS. Um, the other thing is that um, MLKit is uh, not very mature yet. It was released last month only. Um, and it also does some things a little different than CoreML in terms of use of mobile resources versus cloud. CoreML runs your model exclusively on the mobile device. So all the calculation is done there. Um, MLKit can be used in a way that is the same, like CoreML, also just on the phone, but at the same time, you can also run models in the cloud, which of course then allows you to uh, tap into much, much more powerful models that uh, will allow you to implement use cases that are not possible to, to be done solely on the mobile phone due to its limited um, computing powers. Um, then there is another thing that's important to point out here, 
Um, when you do object recognition the way how we just explained it, um, you're running into the problem that you will just know that there is a certain object or concept in an image, in a frame, but you will not know where that is. That's not what these basic algorithms give you. Um, if you need to localize the object in the image also, you're gonna need a more sophisticated approach. Um, you actually need to do object detection. What we spoke about was object recognition. And if you wanna do object detection, th then you need to use uh, more advanced um, um, methods. For example, YOLO, one of the uh, more uh, well-known methods that you only look uh, once um, algorithm. But that's uh, beyond the scope of uh, this talk. And with that, we have actually reached the end of our uh, little overview. Um, if any of that stuff interests you, um, for example, YOLO and whatnot, computer vision, we are hiring here in Warsaw. Uh, take a look at our website. Um, but it's been really great here to give you a little bit of an overview of how augmented reality can help in augmenting objects in the real world and in business processes. And uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and maybe open for questions if we have time.